Thanks to Chief Williams for coming. It's always interesting for me, you know, I've gone around and given presentations about this quite a bit, as I'm sure he has too, but this is the first time we've actually spoke at the same place, and it's interesting to hear everyone's perspective uh, and, and how these kind of presentations, you know, mold back and forth, and, and everyone's experience with what happened that night is, uh, is really different, um, and mine's no different. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, before I took the uh, APD position at ORMC, my former role was the director of the health services department for Orange County. Uh, and in, you know, in that role, I was overseeing the office of the medical director, uh, but also District 9 Medical Examiner's Office, Mental Health and Homelessness, and uh, a couple of the things that are, are completely unrelated to this, right up to including a, the animal services in Orange County. So I was the only medical director that had a dog pound, um, and it, it's as bad as it sounds. If it, it, Dr. Banerjee, if you're interested, I'm sure that Polk County Animal Services would love to have you. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I mention that because the, the unique perspective uh, it gave me. I'm, an, I'm a practicing emergency physician, I'm faculty at ORMC. I was working that night initially moonlighting uh, at South Seminole Hospital uh, and then eventually went down to the scene. But, you know, my perspective of, the, of this comes from a more administrative role in coordinating the response from pre-hospital, but then also our response to mass fatality and family reunification and then the aftermath. So I'm going to try my best not to repeat too much of, uh, of what Chief Williams already told you, although there will be some repetition because some of this stuff is really salient, I think, to what we learned and what really matters. So I won't go into a lot of details about the events, but I'm gonna to try to focus on, on what I call the aftershock, that mass fatality, family reunification, what we learned um, and, and what I think we can do differently. And I realize uh, Dr. Plumley is gonna come on after me and talk probably a little more about what happened at the hospital. So as we mentioned before, this event was unique when it comes to mass shootings in the United States because it was not only an active shooter event, but it then became a hostage event. Uh, so we had really two separate bursts of violence that occurred, one in the beginning and then one at the end with a lull in between. Uh, and that created some, some unique challenges to us, but it also allowed us to do some things with the, with the second group that, that mattered a lot. But I always start with this, the location. Um, you know, this was brought up before, but I think it's one of the most important points that geography dictates the scope of disaster. All right, so if Hurricane Katrina had hit Jacksonville and not a city that was dependent on century old levees, the, the situation would have been very, very different. If uh, the bomb had gone off at Boston Marathon's starting line, which was 25 miles from a trauma center versus the finish line, which was right across from the tent and you know, less than three miles from six different trauma centers, uh, the outcomes might have been very different. And it's no different, you know, what would happen here with Pulse. And, and you guys are familiar with a picture that looks like this. This is Pulse nightclub, and this is the front door uh, to ORMC, which is a level one trauma center that was about 600 yards away, door to door. Uh, and, and as mentioned before, this close distance, this unbelievably short transport time, probably had more to do with, with life-saving than almost any of the clinical things that we were able to do pre-hospital. I'm gonna mention a couple of the more boring things that probably had more to do with saving lives than what we do clinically. That's not to downplay what we do clinically, but it's just to point out that, that luck and serendipity does fall into even these terrible situations. But had this been somewhere else, this would have been very different. This allowed a couple things. First, it was really short transport time for those patients, uh, but importantly, from a transport perspective, the ability to cycle back and forth allowed a very small number of units, uh, including law enforcement, and, and OFD and, and Royal Metro AMR, whatever we call them now, um, to, to cycle back and forth several times. So there was a small number of units that transported the lion's share of these patients. Uh, and that, that's really important when you think about trying to get resources to a scene like this. Uh, it, was, it was cool to hear Rescue 7 when he played that, that audio. That, that, was, uh, that was Carlos Tavares, who's one of our, our medics and also one of the flight medics for uh, air care. And, and Carlos and his team member, whose name I'm blanking on, I don't want to say the wrong one, uh, they, they transported 11 people that night in that one rescue unit back and forth. Uh, there was also a police vehicle that transported nine, one police vehicle. So the ability to cycle back and forth was really big. Uh, the other thing that is so, I guess, remarkable about the location of this attack is how unremarkable Pulse Nightclub really is. So here we are, we're all here in Central Florida. We drill and practice and train for Orange County EMS as a system for terrible events to occur in these kind of places, right? We have some of the most notable soft targets in the entire country. And because of that, we practice quite a bit with these folks, or, or at least we focus quite a bit with what might happen. Uh, city of Orlando has always been a very, very open city uh, and when, it, when it comes to the LGBT community, but Pulse Nightclub wasn't even the second largest gay nightclub in Orlando. It's not a destination in any way, shape, or form. To be perfectly honest, the only reason I knew it existed is because it was next to the Dunkin' Donuts where I got my coffee on the way to the ER like so many of us do at ORMC. So, you know, when people say it can happen anywhere, 
This is as anywhere as it gets, right? So keep in mind that you don't have to be in a big city or big place or have a big target for this sort of event to happen. I won't go into a lot of details about the attack. I think that, that we even have a similar graphic here. Uh, but just to note, you know, what, what was mentioned before, that the, the first person the shooter engaged with actually was an armed off-duty police officer. Um, so so we can, you can push out of your mind, you know, what would have been if there was more guards, if there was more this or that. It's very difficult to predict something like this happening. Uh, as we mentioned before, the shooter entered into this area after evading that police officer and went into the dance floor uh, where most of the original shooting happened. And there was about a three minute, maybe three and a half to four minute period of time before some reinforcements came in and law enforcement re-engaged. And in that amount of time, he fired approximately 190 rounds into this general area. And, you know, I would love to say that that is unique, but when we look at active shooting situations around the country, that's not unique. People that have practiced at all and have large capacity clips with these assault style rifles are fairly adept at getting off hundreds of rounds in a very small amount of time. Uh, Aurora was very similarly a couple hundred rounds in maybe a four or five minute window uh, before his gun jammed. So in, in this attack, what we had was a, a really, you know, an indiscriminate mass shooting in this area. And then when the officers re-engaged, the shooter came back into this maze-like area of bathrooms where lots of people had fled to hide uh, for obvious reasons, but unfortunately found themselves then as hostages. Uh, and in a very short amount of time, law enforcement had pinned him down there and the shooting ha had essentially stopped. And then we get back into what Chief Williams had described as this hostage situation that he went into a lot of detail about. Uh, eventually ending with SWAT re-engaging by punching holes in the back of the building, um, dragging out as many people as they could, then re-engaging with the shooter. Uh, and, and what he didn't say, which I, I think is, is salient, is part of that decision uh, was made, and quite appropriately, when we finally did enter the club and had the ability to, there, there was a, a very bizarre scene near one of those bathrooms of, of decedents who were, were disgustingly, sadly enough, stacked up on top of each other, and what it turned out was that he was hiding behind them, hoping that law enforcement was going to enter and come to him so that he could ambush them. Uh, and it turned out when they punched these holes in the back, he changed his mind and went out and started engaging with them there. Uh, and that, that probably saved a number of lives of our law enforcement colleagues. So the response itself, I think we went into a lot of detail. You can imagine uh, how chaotic this sort of thing is, and you can, or maybe you can't imagine, it, it's hard to. Uh, there's not a lot of endearing images of this because it happens so late at night. Uh, but, but I think that it's important to recognize, you know, some of the things that happen in these scenarios, especially when you have a massive law enforcement response to events like this, is because they have so many cars that can get there so fast. From an EMS perspective, very frequently you get blocked out from access to the scene. This is the next day, so it's a little different, but you can see that this sort of thing happens, right? The entire, the entire street is blocked up. This was a, a lesson that was learned from Columbine uh, and that was unfortunately repeated in, in Aurora and has been in several other mass casualty scenarios where law enforcement vehicles would impede rescue vehicles from getting closer. That's not necessarily something that caused problems here, but I think it's an important point to take away when you're working with law enforcement is trying to recognize when you're trying to access these scenes to keep lanes open for those rescue trucks because part of the problem of getting those patients to us is us getting access to the scene of these, of these events. So this timeline is not uh, physically accurate, but uh, I use it to point out the fact that there were actually three different MCIs of sorts over the course of the 24 hours on, on June 12th. Uh, we had the scene, which we already know about. We had Orlando Regional Medical Center, which was completely inundated with incredibly sick patients in a very short amount of time. And then we had the Family Reunification Center process, which I'm going to go into more detail about. But bear in mind that for every one victim uh, of the Pulse shooting, uh, we had anywhere between five and ten family members and loved ones that, that came out looking for them. Um, and so this became actually a, a much larger beast to handle than we really uh, realized. And I'm going to talk a lot about how I think we could do better and how I hope everyone learns from you know, being able to do this better. <clears throat> so we mentioned the two waves. Uh, I know that, that Dr. Plumley will probably go into more detail about this. Uh, but you know, in, from Orlando Regional Medical Center's perspective, there were two waves of patients. The first one, uh, they had 38 patients in 53 minutes, and at the apex, uh, when, we, when we time it, there was 26 patients that arrived in 26 minutes at one point, almost all of them meeting trauma alert criteria, almost all of them very, very, very sick. Uh, then we had a two-hour lull where only two patients arrived, and then the second wave, nine patients came to ORMC in 22 minutes. Uh, in that second wave, we were also able to transport uh, 11 patients to, to Florida Hospital, Orlando. So there, there was, a, you know, at that point when we had a better setup and distribution in place, we were able to, to not completely overwhelm them again. 
Uh, but what you see in this 38 patients, 56 minutes, 26 patients, 26 minutes, is the result of unregulated transport. And I think as EMS agencies and as professionals that do this in pre-hospital, you have to recognize what kind of stress that puts on a hospital when, when you do this. There's a reason why we do what we do. We have, uh, you know, I know here in Polk County you have a sophisticated system as we do in Orange County where you're calling in and you're giving reports and the hospital knows who's coming and has some general assumption of what you've done and what to expect and how to prepare. Uh, every now and then, you know, we all get surprises. I'm an ER doctor. People walk in, shot. You know, people walk in and collapse. That happens. But to get this number of patients this sick with very little heads up and no real ability to know how many more are coming uh, was one of the most difficult things in the ER and what we were trying to, to, to assuage, uh, what I was trying to assuage as much as I could on the radio and on the phone, as we'll talk about. So in the aftermath of this, we talked about it's the deadliest shooting in modern U.S. history. It was the, the worst attack documented on the LGBT community in, in, in history at all, and the deadliest terror attack since September 11th. And it's hard, I'm sure, for all of you and still for me to realize that this happened you know, in our backyard, uh, but, but here we are. So I won't go into a ton of detail about the pre-hospital approach because I think Chief Williams did a great job talking about how it was approached by OFD uh, and the partners at Orange County Fire Rescue and, and Rural Metro. But you know, the most important points I could point out is this. Situational awareness was huge, right? The close distance to the trauma center and knowing that the most important thing for these patients was to get there. That's where the definitive care was, right? We, uh, I mentioned before, had thought about this. I know the Chief Williams showed you all the drills we had done leading up to this in the training. Um, after Sandy Hook, uh, we had a, a drill at a, a school, the St. James uh, School in downtown Orlando, and we actually worked with FBI SWAT, ironically the same FBI SWAT team that, that came to Pulse later that morning, uh, and also all of our partners. We had Royal Metro there, Orange County Fire. We had SWAT teams from the city and the county. And, and we did a drill on a school shooting, and it was the most eye-opening drill I've ever done. And it was, you know, it was years ago, and I still remember it very vividly because we, we walked around and we watched all of our crews with all their equipment, thanks to the protocols we write, um, you know, trying to, to get their way through this school and take care of patients, putting them on backboards, you know, trying to treat them on the scene while they had officers with guns providing them cover, and, and it just didn't make any sense. And right around the same time, the Hartford consensus came out talking about kind of minimal interventions during these sort of attacks. And we wrote a protocol variance that basically said in, in this sort of setting, in a, in a mass shooting setting, that we wanted minimal interventions. You were not expected to provide the same type of ALS care that we expect for all of our patients not in this scenario. Uh, and we also provided some variance for some of our basic life supports providers to provide certain levels of care that we don't typically do in a normal scenario too. Um, and, and this uh, very much came into place during Pulse. Uh, Chief Williams also described the SAVE training. Uh, most of our agencies, and really OFD took a huge lead on this, uh, provided either SAVE training or an in-house version of something similar to SWIFT Assist Victim Extrication uh, in the, the several years after Sandy Hook but before Pulse, where basically they trained on this idea of holding pressure, opening airways, scoop and run, getting them out, getting them to definitive care. And while some of the tenets of that SAVE training, well, you guys might know about, is going in the hot zone, you know, putting on your vest, the reality of it is, and, and I'll go into more detail about this, there was really no need, and, and it would have been disruptive and very unsafe, I believe, for EMS personnel to enter that club during that night. The, the, almost all of the victims have been pulled out to them, but it was still worth doing that safe training and getting them very quickly to the hospital because of how, what little we could really offer them with this many patients with this kind of severe injuries and this close to a trauma center other than holding pressure, opening airways, and getting them to the right spot. So, so really I think that training had a lot to do with, uh, with how well this was dealt with. Triage tags didn't really happen. Um, they happened to an extent. Some people tried, some people didn't. I have opinions about triage tags. I can tell you when we drill and we use them, they're really nice, they're great because patient tracking is very difficult, but unless you're gonna use them with almost every patient, kind of uh, what, like what they're doing with ballistic vests now where they put them on for every scene of violence so that they'd be ready and have them on, I don't really think that anyone is prepared to do this in a, in a true mass situation. More importantly, I think we need to take a closer look at how we do triage and uh, track these patients in penetrating trauma versus blunt scenarios. Uh, in every other active shooting case in the United States thus far, no one has really had w uh, a successful use of triage tags because it happens very fast, the scene is very fast, and the reality of it is any patient that's got a hole between here and here is a red. And that's where almost all the gunshot wounds were. So, so you ended up with very, very, very few people that wouldn't be tagged red or black anyway. So it really didn't make a difference, uh, unfortunately. I think that a long distance away and with blunt trauma where there's more subtleties to, to how you approach this, maybe it works better, but it didn't change much here.
So when the attack occurred, uh, I was initially uh, moonlighting. I was at South Seminole Hospital in Longwood. My night started at 7 p.m. for my overnight shift. Uh, and I was notified a few minutes after two that there was shooting going on. Uh, I wasn't necessarily too concerned at that time. We have, unfortunately, shootings in, in Orlando not that infrequently. Uh, but then I was getting text messages that it was something kind of big, but no one was really sure what. And uh, I contacted Medcom and, and asked them, and they told me that they had nearly a dozen units responding at this point. And then I contacted ORMC, and they were already starting to receive patients, and it became clear you know, what was happening. So one of the first things we, we attempted to do or tried to do was close ORMC down to everything but pulse patients. We put them on, we have no diversion in Orange County, but we put them on status black, basically shut down the hospital to everything except for patients from this one event. Now, this happened between two and you know, seven in the morning. So the reality of it is there probably wasn't a lot that was coming anyway, but ORMC is also a STEMI center, a stroke center, it's a receiving center. So when it comes down to it, really even in the middle of the night, we can get all sorts of patients, but at the same time, Florida Hospital Orlando, just a couple miles north, is capable of taking care of all these patients as well. Uh, we didn't see a big influx of that, but obviously had this occurred at five o'clock in the afternoon on a Monday, it might've been a very different story. Uh, but we didn't see any delays in the rest of the system, which as a medical director always, always makes you happy when you have big events. Uh, we did have over 600 calls to the 911 dispatch in the course of those couple hours, and, and I'll tell you why that made a difference. But you can see this little text. This is uh, copied from my phone. But um, this is the text message I get out. We have this really great system, you guys all do too, EM Resource, that is supposed to update everyone on what happens when there's an MCI. It updates me as a medical director, it updates all the hospitals, it updates all of our folks that are out in the field, and, uh, and, it, and it works really well. But it takes someone actually doing it, typing it in, there's still a human factor. So this is the first, this is 2.22 a.m., the first and only alert that came out for Pulse which was shooting up to 20 patients, 22 minutes after the, after the shooting started, uh, 15 minutes after patients started pouring into the hospital. It was not updated until about 8.05 a.m. where it said MCI ended. Um, obviously, <laughs> this is not ideal. <coughs> so this is something that we've talked about, how you change. But what do you do when the person who's in charge of doing this, you know, one of them is taking hundreds of calls. So, so how, how, do you, how do you deal with this? And that's, you know, one of those human factors that you have to think about. So I was stuck initially in an ER 20 miles away uh, with two radios and two cell phones trying to communicate. And one of the things that Chief Williams mentioned, which I agree with, is that it was very difficult to wake people up. Uh, you know, we are several medical directors, but none of them I could arouse at, at two in the morning. And I was trying to also get someone to come in for me. I was single coverage in an ER, so I couldn't leave it. So, you know, we're, we're texting, we're calling, we're on radios back and forth to the scene, back and forth to the hospital. Uh, ironically enough, you know, I, sh I show this mostly to point out some of the folks, these are the doctors that were at ORMC that night. Um, Mandy Stone is our assistant medical director. At the time she was a resident, she's still willing to curse at me um, during these things. And Kate Bondani, who was an attending that night, a fellow is still such a millennial, she was using emojis during a terrorist attack, which I, I found really, <coughs> I think it's, it's really interesting because it shows you, you know, that how quick they are in the text, whereas I have to think about all that stuff. Um, you know, but when it came down to it in the end, uh, this is where, where the patients wound up. And you're going to see different numbers. Uh, I think the chief talked about this. Uh, we're pretty certain about most of these numbers. But when it came down to some of the less sick patients that arrived several hours after the fact, the walk-ins, um, no one is 100% certain. Uh, some of it has to do with when your cutoff was. I, I tracked these patients till 8 a.m., from 2 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, and anyone that came after 8 is, is not in this follow-up because at that point I assumed their condition was not emergent enough for me to really say it came from the scene. Um, but in the scene itself, uh, there were 41 patients, all decedents, 39 of them in the club, which was significantly more than, than what we had thought and obviously what we had hoped when, when we first got to the scene. Two at the casualty collection point behind the Einstein bagels. We had 57 patients transported from the scene itself. 46 of those went to ORMC. Um, I think well, Chief Williams and I have, that, have uh, the opposite number here. I had 17 coming from OFD and 15 coming by police. And I'm going to point the police transport out uh, specifically for a second and try to explain that. And then we had 11 that were transported to Florida Hospital Orlando. And, and I don't want to downplay that. A lot of the talking from this point on is going to be about ORMC. And I know Dr. Plumley is going to come talk to you about Orlando Health. But what Florida Hospital did was still really, really impressive because you have to think this is not a trauma center, right? These are not, this is not a hospital that typically gets more than a gunshot every now and then. And they took 11 gunshot wounds that night. None of these met trauma alert criteria, but nonetheless, this is a really big deal. They called in their surgeons, they called in their orthopedic surgeons, and they, they really stepped up. They also offered to take a small number of trauma alert patients if ORMC could not take them. Uh, and that, that wound up not having to be a problem. And then there was a handful of 
walk-in patients that, that came in here, but really it's, it's this group that, that had far and away the, the sickest uh, patients. So two things stood out when we talk about transportation um, and transport of these patients that night. One of them is that civilians stayed to assist. Again, one of the more endearing photos you see, it was in both presentations so far, uh, are, are these patrons trying to help people out. And this is similar to what we saw in Boston. We train for these events to happen and for people to all run away, leaving us with the patients. And in reality, what we're seeing, whether it's resiliency in American culture or, or, or for whatever purpose, people aren't just running away. Lots of them stay and try to assist, and it makes sense. These are their loved ones. This is their spouse. This is their boyfriend, girlfriend, child, mom. So people stayed to try to help. And, and we see that as an opportunity, which I'm going to talk about at the end, about how we can work with our citizens in, in Orange County um, to, to help us with this. The other thing you saw was when it came to the victims, uh, the, the police transported about 30% of them. And this is also nothing new. So what happens when someone calls an all-call major alert, an officer-involved shooting, an active shooting, is that every law enforcement officer within several miles comes flying in their small, quick vehicles that we all see them pass us in our big, hefty trucks all the time, right? They're, they're all over the place and they get there. In downtown Orlando, on a Saturday night into a Sunday morning at 2 a.m., there are literally dozens of off-duty police officers from all over the county and around working their part-time jobs, working as off-duty cops, as security, just like the one that was working at Pulse. So all of these folks, plus all of our active duty folks from all over, not just OPD, but other agencies, came streaming into the source. And they were able to get there in mass uh, before we were able to get there in mass. At the same time, we had three rescue units on scene almost immediately. You heard Rescue 7. Uh, as, a, as a still alarm, uh, Carlos just decided to drive down that way and he picked up one of the first patients. Rescue 5 right there across the street at Station 5 and then Royal Metro 165 which was sitting at the 7-Eleven across the street where they typically stage because we get a lot of calls from that area. So we had three rescues there and several police vehicles and those three rescues and several police vehicles took the first wave, uh, a number of those patients in the first wave. But I mention this for another reason which is in Aurora where there were 27 transports that occurred, almost all of them came from law enforcement and personal vehicles. And if you've ever heard Chief Oates, he's the uh, police chief of Aurora, he's now the police chief of Miami Beach. If you haven't heard him speak about Aurora, he gives an excellent, excellent presentation. He'll tell you for similar reasons that I'll tell you about this. Police got there first in large numbers. He had a problem with the fact that the police blocked off most of his access to uh, the, the movie theater because of all their cars in the way. And they were also positive. They were certain at Aurora that there were two shooters because they had victims in two separate theaters. And that's because the bullets went through one wall and struck people in the second theater. But at the time, you can imagine, everyone was certain there were two shooters. Here at Pulse, we had officers arriving in mass and we had a very, 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 very hot scene, uh, not just of active gunfire, but also a very real threat of explosives. So the police officers were the first ones to get in there and they were also the first ones to start grabbing patients. So, it makes you wonder, you know, is this the right thing to do? Because in reality, whether we like it or not, it seems clear that police are going to transport these victims in these mass casualty situations, particularly in mass shootings, uh, when they are the first ones to actively get onto the scene because they are the armed people that are gonna go straight to the source. They are trained now after Columbine not to help people until they've neutralized the shooter, right? They're gonna run right by you. We all, we've all taken the run, hide, fight course. They're gonna run right by you with their guns out and they're gonna try to neutralize the shooter. But that also leaves them after the shooter's neutralized in a position where they are surrounded by victims and what are they gonna do? They wanna help, you know, they're, they're part of our first response. So this is an interesting study that came out uh, just after Pulse in 2016 and it was looking at the National Trauma Registry and it basically looked at data bank and they looked, and as you can probably imagine, the vast, vast, vast majority of trauma is transported by EMS. But there's a small number, about 3%, that, uh, that go by police. And that's thanks to three cities, Philadelphia, Sacramento, and Detroit. I'm originally from Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, it has just been the way that they've done it, that law enforcement, if they arrive and someone's shot, they toss them in the back of a car and they drive to a trauma center. Uh, it's just always been what they do. So, so that they provided a lot of this data. Uh, when you look at unadjusted mortality, uh, you know, unadjusted mortality, the police transports had, had more victims that died. And that's likely because they were sicker, because they, they got there first and these were people shot in the head. But when you adjust it for how sick these patients were, what kind of injuries they had, it turns out that patients transported by police were no more likely to die than people transported by us, right? And this is with all comers with several hundred. So, you know, when, when they look at this, then they looked at those three specific cities that I told you about. And again, the, the odds adjusted mortality was the same. So I'm not standing here telling you the police should transport our penetrating trauma in, in any way, shape or form. But what I think is important for us to recognize is that in these scenarios, whether you want them to or not, they're going to. Uh, 
and we know that it, it might not make any difference anyway with penetrating trauma. So why not work with them and make sure they know when it's right and when it's not right? Because what happens in Philadelphia, and I know Crawford Meacham well, the, the medical director there, unfortunately sometimes law enforcement is now so zealous about this that they will be the first ones to arrive to a blunt trauma scene and they'll try to transfer those patients and they just don't have the capacity to really understand the subtleties of blunt trauma. And they had an Amtrak collision and they had law enforcement transporting people that should have been immobilized that weren't. They had people going that weren't that sick and people that stayed. So, you know, he's trying to work on this and I think it's important for us to think about it. So if you're in a situation where there's lots of penetrating trauma, the idea of law enforcement transporting is probably a reasonable one because they're gonna do it anyway, so why not work with them? So I'll talk at the end, but we're working with our local law enforcement agencies now to teach them what to do. So if they're gonna do it, at least we can have them do it right, okay? So the hospital approach, won't do a lot of details. I think there's a whole presentation on this next, but understand that over the course of that morning, uh, ORMC did what I have to consider just a miraculous job um, upping everything. They opened up six operating rooms. They called in all of their trauma surgeons, including a pediatric trauma surgeon from across the street at APH. Our emergency department is an academic emergency department. Uh, we are staffed at any given time typically by two or three attending physicians and then between four and six resident physicians. Most of the time we have one senior resident, you know, about to graduate, third year, and a couple of interns, new folks, and then, and then maybe a couple of mid-levels that are doing stuff. In June, where, you know, our, our, our graduating residents, uh, they finished July 1st, so all the, in June a senior resident is two weeks away from being an attending. Uh, it just so happens, randomly enough, that, that on June 12th we had four senior residents in our ER and a fifth that was at Arnold Palmer. We had no interns on, we had no second years. So what you basically had was two attendings and four doctors that were about to be attendings and then we were able to bring another one over from, from Arnold Palmer. So that was just one of those things, again, luck of the draw. If this had happened on July 2nd, we would have had a new senior, a new second year and two brand new interns just out of med school 48 hours before. So, you know, again, timing of this is, is pretty miraculous. Um, <clears throat> when it came to, to ED staffing, uh, you know, usually three o'clock is when we start sending a lot of people home. We have shifts of nurses that leave a little before that. A number of them left and came right back or did not leave because this happened. Uh, I was still up at South Seminole around three in the morning and before they shut all the roads down, we sent down a number of staff that had been trauma trained uh, to try to assist basically as well. So, you know, when it came down to ED staffing, you know, I, I would tell you that we were lucky with what kind of physicians we had. Uh, I would say we are more lucky with the fact that we have really, really, really awesome staff at ORMC when it comes to nurses and RTs and techs and environmental and security and everything else. Uh, one of the, the, the most endearing things for me was the fact that we never planned for this, um, but when they started bringing people for offload, what happened was we had a number of people waiting out front with a number of our stretchers from the hospital, which allowed our EMS and police to literally take the victims out of their cars, put them right on our stretchers, wheel them in and never have to go in. They wiped their stuff down and went right back to the scene, again allowing for a quick cycling of them to get back and forth from the scene. This wasn't something we ever had in writing, but it just happened. And when you watched this, when I watched the, the, the videos of this in the aftermath, what I was shocked by was all of our security guards out there, who I've known over years and years, um, they were out there cleaning stretchers, putting things on, transporting patients. I mean, people were just stepping up and it, it was really incredible to watch. Uh, from a hospital perspective, one of the most boring things that again saved lots of lives, in my mind, was hospital throughput, which if there's any hospital administrators in the room, we talk about it all day long and it stinks. Nobody likes to talk about it. But that night, what they were able to do was clear the trauma ICU out and move people into our medical ICUs and opened up all the beds they could in the trauma ICU. They utilized the, the PACU as a, as a secondary ICU and utilized the MICU for those patients they already had. Uh, internal medicine staff came down and essentially babysat our non-trauma patients in the ER. Our medical ICU started staffing the post-op patients so that our surgeons, who typically staff their own critical care patients, could just keep operating. So the surgeons each took an operating room, one stayed downstairs and kind of decided who was next, and the surgeons in the operating room just kept on operating so that those critical patients that came out were managed by, by medical critical care initially. So again, everyone stepped up uh, and did their best to, to help. Uh, and then, you know, when it came to equipment, uh, thankfully there, there was two things that helped us. One was the lull, uh, where they had a couple hours there where not much was going on. They were able to restock, move people out of the trauma bay and get ready. Uh, we also had a, a very skeleton crew hospital incident command system. Uh, but interestingly enough, our hospital president was one of the first people there. And, and again, something that really means a lot to me was he actually ran across the, uh, the, you know, outside and grabbed chest tube trays from our sister hospitals and brought them back. So here we have, you know, someone up here on the administrative ladder running and getting equipment for us, which I think is just phenomenal and it shows you, you know, how interested they were. So 
I, you know, I show this mostly just to go over the scope of how sick these people were and what it really was that the clinicians inside the hospital were dealing with that night. But in the first 24 hours, our trauma surgeons did 28 surgeries. They did 76 total trauma cases as of today. There's more that will have to be done for a number of these patients. Um, these two things, I think, really kind of shout out at you. In the first 24 hours, 550 units of blood were used and over 17,000 surgical supplies. So, I mean, it's just phenomenal how sick these patients were and how many resources were pushed into them. Uh, the disposition of the patients that they came to ORMC is, is below. We had eight patients uh, that, that were pronounced dead in the emergency department. Um, you know, this is obviously the hardest part probably for our clinicians working at night. They'll tell you this idea of triage that we trained for, of, of putting someone kind of at the black tagging them, right? So the first couple patients that came in that lost pulses and were shot to the chest, they began thoracotomies like we typically would. And it, it was all very obvious that they weren't gonna be able to do this. There was just too many patients and they had to basically make the decision that if someone lost their pulses, they would have to stop working them and move on. And that is very, very different than obviously how we normally treat a, a traumatic cardiac arrest. And it was very difficult for, for the staff to do that. And I think to this day, it's, it's probably what haunts many of them the most. Um, we had 16 patients go directly to the ICU. One of them, unfortunately, lost pulses en route, and again, they turned right around and picked up the next one because that's what they had to do. Three went to the ICU, three went to ICU step down. Eight of them were admitted to floor beds, and 11 patients were eventually discharged straight from the emergency room. But lest you think that that meant they weren't sick, one of those 11 uh, is Officer Mike Napolitano. This is his helmet. Uh, Officer Napolitano is an uh, OPD SWAT. He was shot pretty much squarely between the eyes. Um, and his Kevlar helmet saved him. He came in with a laceration, a contusion. He got sewn up. We thought he should stay. He had no intentions of staying in the hospital. He was generally pissed off. So, uh, <laughs> so he was one of the 11 people discharged. So undoubtedly would have been our 50th victim and it would have been you know, one of our law enforcement members. So uh, it, was, it was one of the, the most you know, painful scenes for me in a night of, of a lot of, of kind of surreal painness was hearing the officer down cry after, after he went down and thinking, oh God, you know, on top of all this, uh, but, but he survived. And the last patient was discharged September 6th uh, in 2016, so many people there. I am a homer, admittedly. I trained at ORMC, I'm faculty at ORMC, I'm, a, I'm a, one of the program directors at ORMC, so, uh, but you know, this is a source of great pride for me. I think Chadwick Smith said in one of the first um, press conferences that it was at the same time the worst and best night of his career clinically because it was the worst thing ever to experience but it was incredible to watch how everyone worked um, you know i think that what amazes me about this is that every single patient that survived to admission to the hospital is still alive today and that is just absolutely remarkable on the morning of the 13th i would tell you that dr cheatham and the other surgeons and everyone taking care of these patients were very open about the fact that our assumption was many more people would die uh, in the next coming days and i think it's testament to the surgery team to the nurses the techs the environmental services to everybody upstairs uh, in the hospital that, that, that worked on all these people. That's just unbelievable to me that all these patients survived. And then the, the second piece that uh, our, our COO likes to tout is this, if you're a hospital administrator, um, is that no elective procedures were canceled that day, which usually gets chuckles when there's hospital administrators here. But um, in reality, it shows you what ORMC was able to do when they ramped up their services to the point that later that afternoon, uh, podiatry cases were going in our ORs. And at 7.30 in the morning, when I first, well, maybe it was about 8 o'clock in the morning, when I first made it back up to the hospital from the scene, I walked through the trauma bay, and it was spotless. It was like nothing had even happened. Um, and, and that just shows you how well they ramped everything up and they were ready for business. In fact, I got calls by about 8.30 from hospital administration asking, you know, can we open back up? Why are, you still, why are we still in status black? They were, they were ready for business again. So it's, it's very, very impressive. Um, as you can imagine in these situations, communication always comes up as one of the biggest things. I think Chief Williams recognized, and I, and I typically point out, that one of the things that we could have done better, the royal we could have done better, is, is at Unified Command. Face-to-face -face communication is definitely better in these situations. It's already very confusing. So when, was, you know, when the command was separated at scene to law enforcement and fire, all of our communication got worse. And, and I think that it's really important message to take to stay together in these events. Right. So far as the hospital is concerned, you know, they, they weren't getting any report. All of a sudden patients were just coming and coming. I was trying to text them and say three more coming, eight more coming, but it, it didn't matter. There were so many patients that were so overwhelmed at that point. So not having that, that unregulated transport was really hard. From the hospital perspective, they also had difficulty waking staff, uh, which we mentioned. Um, and then you have this code silver, uh, which, you know, at, at the time I could have told you, I don't know what a code silver is. Now we know it's, a, it's an active shooter call in the hospital. Uh, and again, this comes down to tensions being high and very strange and difficult communication. 
It's my belief, listening to the radios, that this code silver probably occurred because of radio chatter. Uh, there was a time when, during this lull, when some of our rescue folks did not realize it was a hostage scenario. They thought the shooting was done. Everyone was wondering, why, we, why can't we get in? Why can't we get in? Uh, before it was very obvious that it was a hostage scenario. And at some point, someone mentioned that the shooter was in the hospital. And I think what they meant was as a patient. The shooter had been shot, brought to the hospital as a, you know, as a patient. And then from there, things spiraled out of control. Um, but, but you can imagine, in the heat of all this, all of a sudden thinking you have to go on lockdown. Uh, and the heroics of those people in the Chama Bay, where they literally moved the, they, they moved the, the x-ray machines, the mobile x-ray machines, and blocked the doors and just kept working on the patients, which, again, just, just, just speaks to the heroics of them. Um, and then I mentioned the notification system. You see here, those of you can look, uh, what we do in our hospital when we have trauma alerts, like most people, we pre-register doe names. Um, so you can imagine from a clinical perspective, this is page one of many, many, many pages that night of does. Uh, how do you keep track of all that? And it turned out to be basically ripped up pieces of paper that were getting stuck on the stretchers while they were trying to take care of patients. And what's really amazing to me is how quickly the hospital was able to, um, to rectify that and get everyone their official numbers and their names. But they had to have an MRN number or else it couldn't order blood or anything else. So, you know, it was difficult to do that. Uh, Chief Williams also mentioned multi-agency coordination. Talk about an alphabet soup. You know, when we first arrived, you have OPD and OCSO and OFD and OCFR. We've got really good existing relationships with all that. But by the time the sun comes up, there are these federal agencies there, FBI, FTLE, ATF. ATF's got a fancy truck, by the way. Uh, <coughs> DHA, Department of Homeland Security, DEA. I mean, why were they there? But DEA was there. Uh, everybody was there. So, you know, and at this point, it became very difficult to communicate because we didn't have existing relationships with these folks. Uh, Chief mentioned, and, and it was straight like a movie, we were sitting outside, standing outside the club with vests on, ready to go in to make sure that there was no one left surviving to ensure it with our, so that we could just convince ourselves that it was time to call this a recovery operation. And the FBI agent came up and said, we had no idea he had made claims to ISIS at that point, but said, this, you know, we have reason to believe this is a terrorist attack, it's our scene, no one's allowed on it, no one's allowed off it, and everything came to a screeching halt. It was just like a movie. Um, and, and then we had to start all over again with, with how to do it. So it was very interesting. So the aftershocks uh, are things that, that maybe we haven't talked quite as much about. Nobody likes to talk about mass fatality because nobody likes to drill for mass fatality because no one likes to think about mass fatality. But in reality, it's really important. And I'm glad Todd Stahlbaum's in the room and, and some folks that really worked with us in our medical examiner's office and how to figure this out. So about 7.30 in the morning when it was very clear that there were no more surviving victims and all of the all the injured were in the hospital, this turned into a recovery operation and all of a sudden it became, again, still under the purveyance of our, of our department. This is the medical examiners. So, you know, think about this for those of you who work in a hospital. How do, you, how do you continually take care of patients while respectfully holding nine decedents? It turns out, even in our humongous ER, and we have a 74-bed ER at OMC, we didn't have room for this, and you have all your transporters moving people to the OR and taking care of patients. So uh, what they decided at the hospital was they used our, our decon shower outside, but thankfully curtains, to hold those folks. And even then, it only holds just about that nine. So what do you do in the hospital? And that's something the hospital's thought about. On the scene, it was even more interesting for me. I just mentioned access you know, to federal crime scenes. So like most medical examiner's offices we, um, and coroners, we use contract employees to transport decedents uh, of, of these things. So, you know, the medical examiner inspector comes, and then someone that, that we contract with comes and picks them up in a white van and takes them back to the morgue. Well, the FBI wasn't comfortable with anyone entering that scene that they hadn't already cleared. So basically what that ended up being is myself, Dr. Rawls, Dr. Stephanie, our medical examiner, a small number of ME staff, uh, and that was it until thankfully uh, OPD Hazmat came and helped us out. So, you know, unwittingly, several hours later, uh, myself and, and Rawls, you see, see all these pictures of us out there, were the first ones to re-enter the club and started transporting the victims out. So, you know, these are situations that I had never planned for, uh, but obviously things that, that are important to know. Who's going to actually move the victims? Because they would have been there God knows how many more hours, maybe in another full day, uh, if we hadn't been able to work this out and, and coordinating that transport. Our medical examiner's office is brand new and well, I guess five years old now, but it's humongous. It was built basically to be able to house over 100 decedents, which at the time seemed extraordinarily extravagant. Dr. Garavaglia, Dr. G, you may have watched her show at some point, fought and fought for this, having expansion, having capability for this, and, uh, and it came to fruition because most places probably couldn't hold this many decedents uh, and, and obviously we were able to. Um, what happened with District 9 is they called in all their staff. Uh, I talked to Dr. Stephanie at sunrise about and said, you know, it's going to be a busy day, and, and he hadn't heard about it yet, and he came to the scene. 
Um, and then he came and, and one of the first things I wish I had known about the, you know, beforehand, which hopefully now you know about, came up, which is he walks in the command vehicle, he says, have you guys declared, you know, called the governor and declared a state of emergency. And we're like, why? Shooting's over, we don't need the National Guard, right? And he said, no, you know, we, we, we won't be able to take care of any of these people without the, the Florida Emergency Mortuary Operations Response Team, FEMORS, which I had no idea existed. But it's like our SMART teams and DMAT teams and everything, but for, you know, but for ME's offices. But you can't access them without, without going this route. So we were already a little bit behind the eight ball in my mind, and we started the process uh, to, to get a, a state of emergency declared so that we could get the resources to take care of this. And the amount of resources it takes to take care of these decedents and then reunify them with their family is something that was incomprehensible to me at the time. And I can tell you if there's only one thing you walk away with here, especially the emergency managers in the room, it is start working right now on your family reunification plans and improving them and talk to Todd and talk to other people that have done this because it's, it's a humongous undertaking. Um, the autopsies were all performed within 48 hours, and that was important to us. It was really important for us to get the victims back to their family. I mentioned these injury patterns for, for a specific reason, because we're all, a lot of us here are clinical, but of the 49 victims, um, there were 209 total gunshot wounds, and averaging between, you know, ranging between one and 13 per victim, uh, but they averaged four per victim. So the vast majority of, uh, of, the, of the victims were shot multiple times at close range with this long rifle or, or this pistol. Uh, we only had six individuals that had a single gunshot wound, and four of those were, were to the head. Um, so there were very few people, really only two, that only had one gunshot wound. Um, you know, and, and the most important thing to me as a, as a physician when I was on the scene, when we were trying to get access to that club, as, as Chief Williams asked, and we, and we weren't allowed in just yet, was, man, is there, is there gonna be anyone in there that, that is sanguinated from an extremity when we had all these tourniquets, right? But if we couldn't get in there and put them on, you know, what, what were they for? Um, and, and it turned out that, that there was no one that died from an isolated extremity injury. The closest thing we had uh, to that was someone with a, a very proximal axillary artery wound right here that was probably the fatal wound. Uh, and there's just no way that we would have been able to, to deal with that on scene. Um, so, you know, it, it turns out that's not the case. And it got me thinking again, the pendulum swung way over towards tourniquets, you know, because of all of the evidence that we got from the Middle East. But when these things happen uh, in, in these skirmishes in the Middle East, people are wearing body armor. They got helmets, body armor. A lot of them have armor that covers their torso as well. So, you know, what happens in mass public shootings? And this is another manuscript that came out, you know, the very same year. And basically, it was a, a retrospective report of the autopsies of other mass shootings. This does not include Pulse because it came out after. But what they found was remarkably similar to what we found. You know, they averaged almost three gunshot wounds, 58% to head and chest. The fatal wound was to the head or chest in 77% of the cases. Only 7% had potentially survivable wounds, and none of them died from exsanguination from an extremity. And just like I mentioned about police transport, I am not here to tell you not to carry tourniquets. Tourniquets are very important. It only matters if it's, you know, it only takes one, right? And if you can save someone with it, it's really important. It's an easy device that we can carry. But tourniquets are not the answer to mass public shooting. The reality of it is we're not wearing armor around. And when people are coming and trying to shoot indiscriminately at you, they're not going to shoot your arm and your leg. And if they do, they're going to come back and shoot you again, which is what happened in this case. So tourniquets in that building would not have saved lives. And, and that was is very interesting to us. And the pattern is different than what's in combat. So family reunification. Again, if you take one thing out of this from an emergency management perspective, I wish when I look back and someone had asked, you know, what was the one thing that you wish you had done differently to achieve? I can tell you the one thing I wish I had done differently is three or four in the morning when it was becoming clear how bad this was, I wish that I had already started thinking about how we were going to deal with the families and deal with everyone together. But the thought had never even crossed my mind until I got a phone call from Carlos uh, Carrasco at, at Orlando Health about you know, 7.30, 7.45 in the morning, and he said, there are hundreds of people showing up here. We already have all these patients. What, what are we gonna do? And it became our third MCI scene, figuring out what to do. So you know, at the same time, we were having discussions about starting hotlines, and then we figured out, well, first you have to have the lines, then you have to have the call takers, then they have to have a script. So we talked to the ME's office, and it turned out everything that our hotlines were asking was not what they wanted for identification purposes. So we had to go back and redo the script. Um, and then we realized lots of people don't call hotlines anymore. They go online or they tweet. So, you know, we had all these thoughts that I look back and say, man, we could have done this beforehand and we could have been ready for this. Um, so, so I really, really recommend, you know, thinking about that because it was late morning by the time we really had our grasped how we were going to start this process. We initially moved people to the, uh, the relatively new Ham Hampton Inn, I think it is, Holiday Inn, whatever it is, across the street from our hospital. They said they would take us until they realized what was going on and they were like, nah, mm-mm. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so eventually we were able to work with the city and, and acquire the, 
some real estate at the Beardall Center, which is a, a senior facility uh, just a couple blocks away from the hospital. But even that took several hours. We had to set it up, we had to get staff there, we had to transport people from the hospital for there. Uh, and, and before you knew it, it was 11 o'clock at night and you had people who had nowhere to go. And now we have all these people saying, well, now where do I go? We have people travel in here trying to find their loved ones and we still hadn't been able to necessarily identify them. Um, so then we had the process of how do you house people? How do you feed people? Feeding them became easy because people brought us food for the next you know, like two months straight, kept bringing us food, which was really nice. But, um, so, so that was really important. One of the, the, one of the really incredible things you know, that went on at the hospital that I assume that Dr. Plummy might talk about was this decision that was made by the surgeons to, to essentially start listing off the names of who was at the hospital because we needed to separate the victims' families who were being treated so they could be there for that healing process and be there as part of that hospital family away from those who we could not identify yet but were decedents and separate out even further, hopefully, those people who were missing but were actually asleep in their bed somewhere because they were out until 1.30 in the morning and you know, just hadn't answered their phone. So the hospital made the, the very, I think, heroic decision to stand up there and say, these are the people we have. And it was, I'm sure, the worst moment I imagined of Dr. Cheatham's life. And I think it was the worst moment for a lot of people as we figured that out. So coordination of the Family Resource Center turned into this several day long event. You had the medical examiner's office, you had federal investigators, we had local investigators, we had chaplains, we had victims assistance, crisis assistance, and eventually security because all the media really wanted was, you know, pictures of, uh, of people crying. And we'll talk about that third aftershock, which is, which is the media approach. Um, I don't want to move on without mentioning, I know Jessica's here, I know Todd's here. Um, you know, it turned out, because we hadn't planned much in advance for this, that the folks that ended up administrating and overseeing the Family Reunification Center ended up being folks from the Office of the Medical Director's office staff. And, you know, Jessica's our training center coordinator for AHA. It's not exactly part of her job description to be helping oversee this. So, again, for those of you who think that you're not going to end up in this role, there's no one really meant for this role, and all of a sudden we were asked to do it. So, you know, as usual, we all work in emergency medicine, you step up and you do it. So just bear in mind. Uh, if, if you think that, and thank you, you know, Jessica and Todd for everything you did. So media relations was the third aftershock that I was not prepared for in any way, shape, or form. My original job, I used to deal with local media all the time. It was something we did. I mentioned, remember, I have the animal shelter, so God knows, I was talking to media all the time. Every time we gave a dog a bad haircut, I was, uh, you know, on Channel 9 <laughs> explaining it away. But, you know, this was an entirely new thing. So, so just to think about the privacy laws, right, that people have, and then the public record laws of our great state of Florida. So public records in Florida are wide open. Florida government in the sunshine. Those of you who work for the government know this. Pretty much everything you do is open, right? And that includes 911 tapes. That includes autopsy reports. That includes things that we felt were intensely private to the families of the victims. Um, so, you know, we ended up working very diligently to try to figure that out. You have to know your points of contact. Chief Williams mentioned that they wished that they only had one PIO number. The county was the same way. We had multiple PIOs for multiple different groups. They coordinated it really, really well. Uh, several months before Pulse, we, had, we were given a PIO for, for our department, which I thought was way overkill. Carrie Proudfit, who's not here, but I'll give her a shout out because at the moment that she came on, I thought, I don't know why we need this. And then for the, the week that followed Pulse, I would not have been able to survive without her. Um, so, so I think knowing your points of contact, knowing your social media rules for your agencies, because every single one of you has a little computer and all of us like to post stuff. And you've got residents and med students and firefighters and EMTs and people posting things that either are inappropriate or illegal. And you've got to make sure that you know what they're doing. And then dealing with elected officials, um, you know, bless their hearts in the Southern way. Everybody likes to come and be part of this. And sometimes it's really important and useful. And sometimes it's a real burden to those of us who are trying to take care of operational things. So, so it was a difficulty. But I, you can see pretty much this is the view if you walked out of Pulse trying to get to the hospital. So every time I went back and forth for the first couple of days, I had to go through that throng. And then everywhere they went, particularly the victims' families went, there was this throng of media. And when it came to, to them, I, I won't make you read all of this, but I think it's important to recognize. Uh, this is a subpoena, essentially, for 911 records. It was from ABC, the Associated Press, Chicago Tribune, basically all of the major media outlets. They were nice enough to wait, I think it says the 23rd, so they were nice enough to wait 11 days before they sued us for access to videos and pictures and audio of people getting murdered, right? Because they want clickbait and they want to do it, and that's what it is. So this was just totally shocking to me that we'd be in a situation where we couldn't even try to protect the privacy uh, of those people who were killed or injured. So be prepared for that. And this is where you really need to lean on your PIOs. A couple other little additional things that we weren't truly expecting. 
uh, you know, rehab, it was 90 plus degrees. The day this happened, it was 90 plus degrees for the next several days afterwards. There were weeks of evidence collection going on. Um, Todd and our folks brought our, brought our emergency equipment out, our, our you know, basically pop-up hospitals, these tents that were air conditioned and electrified, not for the patients. There's, there's nothing more we could do for those patients, uh, but actually as rehab for those folks who were collecting evidence and cleaning it because it was really hot. It's not air conditioned in that building. It was a, it was a mess. The building itself was a hazmat scene. Uh, during the firefight, the fire suppression units went off and there was a, an unimaginable amount of blood on the floor mixed with then several inches of water. So every one of us that went in basically had to put on the, the Tyvek suits and everything to try to get in and out. Uh, and then, you know, we had to deal with waste. Uh, so, you know, one of the first things that we ran out of was red bags and stuff because everything was covered in blood. So again, things we didn't think of that people ended up asking me or Todd <laughs> to answer that were not things that we were really necessarily prepared for. Uh, and, and finally, I think that this really very important that comes out to the, uh, our surgeons and also the Department of Health uh, in Orange County who came together and actually offered post-exposure prophylaxis to all the victims or anyone else that came in contact with any of the blood that night as a high-risk population. So I thought it was really, really good that they were able to do that and they, they tracked down almost everybody. We mentioned crisis assistance before. <coughs> I won't mention all the great crises that went on at ORMC, but almost 1,000 people were served at the Citrus Bowl uh, you know, over the, the next several days before we were able to open up the Orlando United Assistance Center, which remains open today. Um, one of the things that I look back on that I wish I had done better as a, as a manager at that time was take care of, of my own staff. I think that the fire departments and law enforcement are really good at this. They have teams in place to do this. They brought down people from New York and from Boston. Um, it was easy for me to forget that we had you know, administrative staff that, that were highly involved, particularly in family reunification, but no one really thought to offer them a lot until I think the, after the fact. Um, you know, we have people that, that have pretty administrative jobs in our office, but spent two days listening to families find out that their loved ones had died. And it was emotionally really incredible. Uh, I can tell you having been in that club and also in the family reunification center, that the day after, you know, the 13th was way harder for me emotionally than the 12th. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that anyone who's involved there can say that. So I wish that I had thought ahead to the fact that people that maybe weren't involved in the actual scene of it needed just as much help as those that weren't. So I highly recommend those of you who are in administrative positions to think about all of your staff, not just the ones that were there. Um, vigils, we talked about this. Everyone's on the scene the day of. No vigils, no vigils, no vigils. We're, we're overwhelmed. We don't want this. All the elected people got up and said, no vigils. Somebody got a vigil and all the elected people are standing up there talking in front of it. So uh, it happened. This was the next two days later. It was on Tuesday, I believe. Uh, I actually ran right into Chief Williams standing outside of it. I had worked in the ER that day and came out. There was supposed to be 100 people and there was 10, you know, 10,000 or so. It was 90 degrees. We had people dropping, passing out. We ended up opening up a little pop-up tent and having several units there and transporting people away. So, but you can't stop the community from wanting to be a part of this and I think that's important. Um, one of the beneficial things that came from this in my mind was seeing the community come out it, it was really miraculous uh, watching this happen over the last year. Um, two things I'll point out really quickly. You know, this is the line for One Blood Center. The One Blood is maybe, I don't know, four blocks away from Pulse. So the day of the attack, the lines were so long you couldn't see the end of them to donate blood. And again, 90 plus degree heat. This is really incredible to me. Mentioned before the Orlando United Fund raised tens of millions of dollars for the victims. Again, I'm a homer, I won't deny it. It makes me very proud, both Florida Hospital and Orlando Health waived all the fees uh, to all the families for this, which I think is, is really a beautiful gesture as well. So last couple things we mentioned before, preparedness. I am, it's like it being an AA, I'm a, I'm a medical director who does not like drills. <laughs> and I have learned that I'm wrong and that I need to embrace them. So many of the things that went right were because we drilled and practiced. Okay, so I'm one of those physicians, like many other physicians, who when it's time to drill, I roll my eyes, I wanna see the real patients, I don't wanna see the fake ones, but when it comes down to it, we learn so much. And drilling not just for the event, but the aftermath, family reunification, mass fatality, how are you gonna deal with the other people that show up is really important, right? Long-term strategies are important, but I won't go into it. I think that Chief Williams also mentioned the importance of existing relationships. The fact that I was in a situation where I knew I could call the CEO and the COO of Orlando Health at four in the morning, and, and, and wake them up, you know, or the fact that I've known Roderick for so long and I've known Chief Mina for so many years that, that we were able to communicate really well. And I think building those relationships within your community is huge because it really takes that when this goes on. Um, and then the evidence-based practice that exists, there's not a lot, but it's there. I think that it's really important at this point we recognize that save training or something similar 
looking at minimal interventions and getting people to definitive care in mass, in mass casualties, and particularly in mass shootings, is really important. I think having protocols for when law enforcement is going to, whether you want them or not, transport patients is important. And so is teaching them what the right thing to do is. And same with our civilians. So we're providing tactical medical training, which I'll, I'll talk about. I, I'm gonna run out of time, so I won't go through all this. I'll just let you know there is a little bit of evidence about disaster planning versus reality that came out there. And it, it was uh, eye-opening to walk through what happened with us. And basically, we fall into the same category as every one of these other events. Very, very few things that we think are gonna happen, happen, and yet we know this. We should know better. You know, we plan for good dispatch, but units are gonna self-dispatch when this happens. You know, field triage sort of happens. The reality of it is people go to the closest hospital. It so happened here, the closest hospital was the right one to go to. It's a trauma center. But imagine if this had happened two blocks away from a much smaller hospital. You know, uh, you know how could you handle this? Because that's where they're gonna go, especially when police are transporting them and you have unregulated transport. So it's worth thinking about. Finally, you know, in the future, we're working on family reunification hotline, mass casualty plans. We're working on our mass fatality. We are working within the Orange County Office of the Medical Director and Orlando Health Trauma Center to provide bleeding control training for civilians and for law enforcement. If you're interested in hearing more about it, we'll be happy to talk to you about that more. But like I mentioned, we saw opportunity in the fact that civilians didn't leave and that law enforcement transported patients. If you know a better way to track patients in MCIs, I'm all ears because we're still kind of up to our ears in it. I can tell you that our surgeons at Orlando Health created a, a website that's really cool that I don't know if Plumlee's going to talk about, but basically for helping rec recognize these patients and identifying them. Uh, and then finally, trying to find a way to ensure these real-time updates for, the, for this notification. We have a system that was supposed to notify everyone about how many patients they were and where they were going, but it, but it never got updated. So you know, if you don't have it, it, it doesn't make much sense. So I usually end on this photograph because you know, I, I think it's, it's very eye-opening to see the, just the dramatic number of patients. Um, you know, for those of you who went to any of the vigils and they, when they ring a bell 49 times, you realize just how long it takes to do that and how, what an unbelievably unfathomable toll this was. Um, it, you know, it, it's really unbelievable to me. And some of these faces mean more to me than others because some of them were, were people that I, that I recognize. Um, and, and I call them all patients, but patients I remember taking care of even though when I saw them, uh, unfortunately, they were, they were all decedents. Um, you know, but one of the things that comes from this, you know, that came from it for me was being a medical director in a community. Several others called me, um, those that were involved in, in Katrina and in Boston and New York, and all three of them basically gave me the same thing in Colorado. They said, you know, it's hard those first few days, it's surreal, then it, then it becomes hard to get back to normal, and then what will surprise you is months later or even years later, something else bad will happen and it will open up all those wounds again. And, um, and I never really understood that because I never really lost anyone close to me. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, earlier this spring, one of my, my closest friends and dear colleagues, Sal Silvestri, passed away, and I know a lot of you knew Sal. Sal was a program director in our emergency department, and he was intimately, intimately involved in every aspect of what we just talked about here. And when Sal passed away, it basically opened up every one of those wounds in our ER. I can tell you, so many people who had felt like they were better weren't better anymore. And it wasn't just Sal, it was Pulse, it was everything. It was what, what is happening to us this year. So I think it's important, and I'll leave it on this note, that you need to support each other. When you're involved in these sort of things, you need to be there for each other, and that's, that's all we can do. So I understand now that I have lost someone so close to me, what, a, what an um, just unbelievable toll it was for those 49 families, because every one of those people had just as many people as Sal had who loved them, who, who lost them. So it became much more real for me when this happened. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions for anybody, and I know I went a little bit over, so sorry, Plumlee. But. <clears throat> was the hospital made aware of the second possible wave of yes. patients that were going to come? So they were yeah. made aware of that. At that, at that point, um, it, we, we were in a situation where I was able to communicate with them that there was going on. I think that there was a short period of time in the ER when that lull happened where there was a lot of confusion, people thought it was over. And that's where some of those text messages, if you go back, you see I'm talking to Gary Parrish and Kate Bondani and saying it's not over, it's not over, there's still patients here. Um, because we weren't aware just yet either, but then when it became clear it was. And, and I think that that lull really helped the hospital transition you know, into being prepared for that second wave. And also, we had a lot more units on scene and a lot more structure at that point. We were able to better triage those less sick patients out to, to Florida Hospital. And basically, our triage goal was anyone who meets trauma alert criteria goes to the trauma center until they say no more, and everybody else goes somewhere else. So that was, that was the plan, and that's how it worked in the second wave. <clears throat> So BCON is a, is a course that was created by NAEMT, and it was recently, I guess, purchased or shifted over, so it's part of like PHTLS or whatever now, 
Um, so it's a, it is actually a, a standardized course, kind of like you know BLS, but it's a two-hour structured two-hour course on holding pressure using tourniquets, opening airways. Um, if anything, it might be you know longer than it needs to be. Uh, but we wanted something that was already created, that was unified, that we could say, all right, you know, here's an accredited sort of thing. So we've been training trainers uh, in Orlando. Health is going to be offering courses, and then we're working as best we can with anybody who wants to, who wants to train, basically. So it comes down to the fact that civilians and the officers stuck around, and we're transporting people, and we want to make sure at least, in the very least, they know how to put on a tourniquet. Or for me, more importantly, they know how to hold pressure. I mean, how many times do we see people you go to a scene and someone's got a big towel on someone's head and they're holding it up here and it's just filling up full of blood but they're not holding any pressure on it. So I think it's important. <clears throat>